six miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Hail to the king, baby. Welcome, one and all, to the world of Stew. Hello and welcome to episode 54 of World of Stew. And not only is it episode 54, but it's a return to our sort of regular broadcasting because over the last couple of weeks, well, there wasn't a show last week, and the two shows prior to that were more review heavy as we looked at first the MCU Civil War, and then, of course, we looked at Fox's X-Men Apocalypse. So we are back to our regular programming. When I say we, obviously, all you've heard from so far is my good self. So without further ado, allow me to introduce my co-host. He is the Dr. Manhattan to my Rorschach. It's Dave. You know, I'm glad I'm a sensible, all-powered one, and you're just, you're just loony and weird mask. Uh, yeah, but, you know, Rorschach is pretty cool. Rorschach is pretty cool, you know, he's kind of, um, he's a bit more insane than Punisher really, isn't he? He is. Um, of course, that is a reference to something that I will imagine you are going to mention in your Week of Geek later on. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Without further ado, Dave, we are going to start this week's show with a topic that I'm going to put my hands up now and admit I have become fairly obsessed with. It's not Mr. Fig, is it? Right. And by that I mean I watch the trailers and I've watched them several times and each time I get madder and madder and my wife will attest to the fact that I am constantly bitching and moaning and complaining about this particular topic. I also spend hours on YouTube watching other people's reaction videos because they're just so damn hilarious. It is, of course, the topic the Ghostbusters 2016 reboot. Yay. So, obviously we haven't done this show properly, so to speak, for a few weeks now, a month. Um, There's a couple of things that have happened recently. The director, Judd Apatow, you know him? Uh, Yeah, I do. I can't remember off head what he's done, but I do know him, yeah. Yeah, well, he's not that famous, is he? Well, anyway, he's a good friend of Paul Fagg's, and he's weighed in on the whole Ghostbusters... um, hatred debacle, uh, he had the following to say. I would assume there's a very large crossover of people who are doubtful Ghostbusters will be great, and people excited about the Donald Trump candidacy. Candace, can, how do you say that? Candidacy. Candidacy. Candidacy, that's the one. Um, I would assume they are the exact same people. That movie is made by the great Paul Feig and stars the funniest people on earth, so I couldn't be more excited. I think people have paid too much attention to some angry trolls and it will be judged on its own greatness. So there, Judge Apatow is saying that anyone who hates Ghostbusters loves Donald Trump. See, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? And you know what, I've been... I've kind of been following this on and off. And it is kind of quite funny how it's becoming a bit of a war, isn't it? A bit of a war of words between basically Paul Feig and the cast of the new Ghostbusters, and just people online who have... We, we watched the trailers, we had our doubts about making a reboot of a movie that we love, and we've seen the trailer, and we're just like, no, no, it, it's lo- it looks rubbish. And it's not just a few trolls. It's not just a few sexists. I'm sure there's a few sexists who are like, no, man, don't go make a film with women. It should be in Shakespearean time, just like it was. But, you know what, there's like... Not many people like that. It's just people who think the trailer's rubbish and you shouldn't have remade it. Well, speaking of the trailer, it is currently, um, and this is a couple of days ago, stands at 246,895 likes and 858,156 dislikes. I think that's more likes than before, isn't it? So maybe they're making progress. 
Um, it should be noted, of course, that there has been another trailer that's come out, which we'll discuss in a moment, because I want to go back to Melissa McCarthy, who, of course, is the star of the film. Um, she's had some more to say, and she's now coming out in defence of Paul Feig. She says, um, all those comments, you're ruining my childhood. I mean, really? Four women doing any movie on Earth will destroy your childhood. Yes, it well will. Um, I have a visual of all those people not having a Ben, which is her husband, not having friends. So they're just sitting there and spewing hate into this fake world of the Internet. I just hope they find a friend. So not only are all the people that hate this film Donald Trump supporters, but they're all loveless, friendless loners who sit in their mum's basement. You know what? It just goes to show she doesn't get it. She just doesn't get it. She just doesn't get why, you know, even remaking of such a great classic film is kind of offensive in the first place. I mean, let's, let's you yeah, know, let's, if you compare it to someone like, uh, uh, say, I don't know, Gus Van Sant. He remade Psycho, yeah? Which a great director, a great filmmaker. He's done plenty of his own films. And yet, for some god awful reason, he decided to go remake, go and remake Psycho. And it wasn't very good. He made a, a bad remake of a great film. That wasn't necessary. This just goes to show she doesn't get it. She's got this image of her head of, you know, uh, of geeks and nerds all being these friendless people in basements. And it's not. It's people, you know, what, when did Ghost of Us come out? Now? Was it 1984, 5? 84 was the original. I mean, there's a generation of people just like you and me now. We're 40 years old. We've watched the originals loads of times. We've let our kids watch it. We love it. And, you know, okay, we might not have a right to feel like this belongs to us, but can you be fair to say that films as great at this? They're part of our childhood. They're part of our identity almost. No, I agree with you, Dave. Britain's Got Talent. Did you see the final? I didn't see the final. I'm just one of these people, you know what, I've seen the odd highlight, but... I haven't had to, time to watch it on TV. Now, you're probably wondering what that's got to do with Ghostbusters and why do I bring it up? Well, the reason why I bring it up is because during one of the ad breaks for Britain's Got Talent, uh, the live final which was on in the UK a few weeks ago, um, they showed a TV spot for Ghostbusters in which there was a world-exclusive clip of Dan Aykroyd in his role as a cab driver Okay, I didn't see that. Right, now I didn't see it either, but some eagle-eyed viewer in the UK saw it, posted it to YouTube, it exploded all over the internet, and within literally, a friend of mine uh, posted it on Facebook and linked me to it. I was about 10 minutes late in seeing that viewing, and in those 10 minutes, Sony had removed all trace of it. Really? Yeah, <laughs> right. Now, the reason why I mention this is because, I don't know if you remember, but back in March of this year, um, a Reddit user leaked what he claimed was the plot to the entire film. Yeah, uh, I do remember that, actually. Yeah, and what he did was he said that he was working on post-production, so he had seen a version of this film. So, this happened in March before any of the trailers came out, okay? Right. Now, you've seen all the trailers, correct? Right, I have. Right, even the most recent one. Uh, yes, that's right. So, when you actually go back and you look at this plot, which I'm now going to read out to you, you tell me if, based on what you've seen on the trailers, that this sounds like someone who's making it up or someone who's actually telling the truth. So we start with Rowan, who is a hotel worker who can see ghosts. He's been bullied and called a weirdo his whole life. There's a scene in the back room of a hotel where he is working on a machine that releases ghosts. It breaks the barrier between the living and the dead. He wants to release as many as he can so he can torment the living. He says the following line. And the universe shall bend to your will. As if to validate his actions after being bullied and rejected his entire life. Leslie Jones is a subway station worker and a hotel worker. And a hotel worker who happens to be Rowan brings a machine in to the subway station to channel and awaken old ghosts. He briefly mentions the fourth cataclysm and Jones brushes him off as a nut job. He walks out onto the tracks and she follows him. When she's on the track, she sees the ghost he released and ends up joining the Ghostbusters for her street smarts. She also sees a graffiti artist spray paint the white ghost from the logo in the subway 
As she's telling him to stop, he puts the red circle and the line through the ghost. So far, that sounds pretty accurate, doesn't it? That does sound about right so far, yeah. Right, from what we've seen. Well, at this point, nothing about the old Ghostbusters being around or alive is referenced. They stumble across the old Ghostbusters firehouse, but can't afford the rent because it's $21,000 a month. So they start their own HQ at a Chinese restaurant, uh, which means there's plenty of wontons for Melissa McCarthy's character. Because uh, they make a big deal in the film about her character liking wontons. Uh, Chris Hemsworth applies as a secretary, and he's a moron, but a little funny at times. They bust their first ghost Dave at a cheesy rock concert, where a large green dragon that the audience thinks is part of the band's act appears. Jones is chased by a possessed mannequin, saying, This is more intense than an Usher concert. One of the concert goers has a selfie stick, you can kill yourself now, and takes a picture of the dragon ghost as it is perched on Leslie Jones's shoulder in the crowd. They crowd surf at one point, and they capture the ghost and become famous. They get their name from a new segment pegging them as the Ghostbusters, without referencing anything that happened in the past with the old Ghostbusters. Is that or is that not? exactly what happened in the latest trailer that does sound a hundred percent right yeah i mean even down to the even down to the concert that sounds totally right yeah right well as we carry on they get the ghostbusters car from jones's uncle played by ernie hudson although he doesn't actually show up until the end of the film the main villain rowan that jones is countered in the subway meanwhile is channeling more ghosts in mirrors with a very large machine again in the trailer yeah, but, yeah, that is in the trailer, isn't it, the whole bit? Yeah. Uh, he knows what the Ghostbusters are doing and goes into a rant about how he wants to do the opposite. He, he releases all the tormented ghosts because he wants them to pester the lives of the living. And by pester, he means torturing and taking apart their flesh. He says the same line from earlier, except he says the, wor he says the word world instead of universe, as in, and the world will bend to your will. Uh, the Ghostbusters corner him and say cops are on the way. Instead of activating the huge machine, he grabs these electrical currents and dies. The mayor, played by Andy Garcia, finds out and makes out to the public that the Ghostbusters are hoaxers. Now Rowan is a ghost, and he possesses McCarthy. Then he possesses Hemsworth after Jones slaps the ghost out of McCarthy. Is that or is that not in the first trailer? Yeah, that was in the trailer. Yeah. Um, Hemsworth then travels on the Ecto-2 motorcycle to the ghost channeling machine to release them all. He releases them all... And there's a scene where a scared cop is walking up to him and tries to talk to him. Hemsworth turns around and snarls with glowing eyes, just like Rick Moranis did in the original Ghostbusters. Um, he releases the tormented ghosts and they spread across the city. Meanwhile, Kristen Wiig discovers the hotel guy went to school or something with them, since the Ghosts of Our Past book he scribbled in has a ton of weird stuff on the pages of one of the copies. On one of the pages there's a picture of his face and many people and ghosts with this written... I will lead them all. Hemsworth is controlling the city with his ghost powers, and at one point he makes the army dance of him to You Should Be Dancing by the Bee Gees. That sounds rubbish. That sounds lame. And if you actually freeze frame an image from the trailer, and I posted this picture on Facebook, you can see when they're walking through some doors, the police and the army are outside behind them, and you can see them all pointing their fingers up in the air as if they're doing like the Saturday Night Fever dance. Ugh. Yeah. Um, Good uh, idea was to dance number in a film like this. Uh, no idea. So we carry on. Um, the Ghostbusters face off against him, and the ghost leaves Hemsworth's body, thus sparing his life. He then asks, What form do you choose? There's no real explanation as to why he says this. He just does. Leslie Jones' character says out loud, Oh, I think that spray-painted ghost from the subway was cute. So he turns into the ghost from the Ghostbusters logo. <laughs> Again, that is in the trailer. Yeah, it is, isn't it? That, uh, you, you can't see a bit of the ghost as well, don't you? Yeah. Um, he gets bigger and expands as large as a tall building, busting out of it to expose the portal. There's a portal on the ground, and he says cheesy lines like, Here's Rowan. Um, don't you want me to join? Uh, don't you want to join me in the Army of the Dead, which is a bit close to Army of Darkness for my liking? Yeah, that does sound very familiar, doesn't it? It is a bit of Army of Darkness-ish. Now, Slimer is in the film, as we know from the trailers, and he and a female Slimer who has brown hair steal the Ghostbusters car and drive it around. Why do they do that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to get to that, Dave. 
Uh, the Ghostbusters decide to cross the streams, but that doesn't work. Slimer and the female Slimer drive the Ghostbusters car into the portal. This gives McCarthy and Wig the idea to lure the big stupid Ghostbusters logo ghosting into the portal before it closes. Um, and they take themselves inside as well. They basically go inside this portal and the ghost chases them. Um, but they've tied themselves to a tow cable from a fire truck. Um, the plan, of course, works. The big ghost goes in and the portal closes uh, with Wig and McCarthy apparently gone forever. Of course, they're not because they're tied to the fire truck, so they just pull the, the cord and out they come. Um, they're still branded as hoaxers, however, uh, but now they can afford to rent the old Ghostbusters firehouse. Leslie Jones's character listens to an electromagnetic tape, and one of the Ghostbusters asks, You get something? To which Jones replies, Yeah, I heard something really weird. Who is Zool? Q, the closing theme. Yeah, so really, is it is it a sequel, or is it... This is kind of a sequel, isn't it? Well, They're it's just not admitting it's a sequel. Well, it's not a sequel, is it? It's a complete reboot, but it's not a clever reboot. It's basically just we're remaking the original film, just with four different people. Yeah. Uh, I, I still read a like the sound of it. I, mean, I don't think there's anything in there that I can really get to grips with as being... Yeah, let's be honest, Ghostbusters was one of those once-in-a-generation kind of films where there's, there hasn't been anything like it since. But the depressing thing is, Dave, is that that plot summary is 100% accurate. So that is exactly what's going to happen in the film with the dance number and everything. Yeah, and this sounds like it's got to be right because um, there was stuff that was in the second trailer... Because this was released before the second trailer, wasn't it? This plot. This, this, this plot no, this came, this, this came out before any trailers were released. Yeah, and that is 100% like what's in the trailers. Right, so there were no trailers, so there was no way this person could have known about the, the power of Patty compels you slap in. He couldn't have known about the green ghost dragon. He couldn't have known about it sitting on her shoulders. He couldn't have known about the selfie stick. He couldn't have known about Chris Hemsworth riding the motorbike. There's absolutely no way this person could have known any of that unless his claims were true. Oh, he's, on, he's on the inside somewhere. Yeah, I've, well, he's probably not on the inside anymore, unless it's the inside of a jail cell. <laughs> well, I don't know. Would they, would have, they'd probably just take him for all he's got when they sue him financially. Anyway, as we know, Dave, the originals are all in this film, right? Right. right. Well, Bill Murray, he plays a sceptic, um, and he has lines such as, Why are you pretending to catch ghosts, and That a girl... Uh, he gets killed when he's pushed out the window by the rock concert Ghost Dragon. Apparently he goes to the Ghostbusters um, base, or, or you know, whatever you want to call it, and he convinces them to release a ghost to prove to him that there is such a thing. They release the Ghost Dragon, it knocks him out of a window and he falls to his death. Oh, well, that's kind of on them, isn't it? That's kind of on them, that's yeah. just negligent. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, he plays a cab driver who, refri who refuses to drive the Ghostbusters, when New York City is in havoc, um, and he says the line, I ain't afraid of no ghosts. And we know this to be true, because this was in the UK TV spot. Oh, I just really wish they hadn't agreed to be in it. The worst part is, from what I've heard, rumours-wise, is that after he says, I ain't afraid of no ghost, whoever he says that to, shouts after him, saying, that's a double negative, so that means you are afraid. Yeah, very true, but you, you really shouldn't say stuff like that in a film. Yeah. Uh, Sigourney Weaver, she plays a mentor of Kate McKinnon's character. Uh, she's disappointed, but approves of McKinnon's work by the end of the film. Uh, finally, Ernie Hudson, he plays Leslie Jones's uncle, and he owns a hearse company. When he finds out that they lost the original Ghostbusters car, uh, Jones goes to him for another one. Hudson says, i got four funerals this weekend, I can't do it with one hearse. Jones says, can't you do two at a time? Hudson replies, I'm not stacking them like flapjacks. I still, I just don't see the need for this bit. Why, why, just shove these, why just shove Ernie Hudson in there? I mean, I hope that they're going to look back on it at some point and just really regret being in this film. Apparently there are constant references to YouTube, Amazon, and one to Reddit. Um, McCarthy loves wontons, as I've already said. Jones is kind of funny, but definitely just... 
a sassy sort of funny stereotype character. Uh, McKinnon is gross funny. Uh, cue fart noise and the line that came from the front. And Wig is just bland, hopeful scientist who tries to make sense of her life and wants to bang Chris Hemsworth. Bang Chris Hemsworth. Which again is in the trailer. Most women do, but there you go. So that was the leaked plot of Ghostbusters from March. Um, I would say pretty much that should just about tell you everything you need to know to not go and see this film. I know, I kind of almost feel now that I've, I've disliked this film so much already, I kind of almost want to go see it to kind of um, just so I can justify my feelings. Because there's a popular YouTuber called Angry Video Game Nerd. And I think I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, he reviews films and he posted a video basically saying that he was refusing to review this film purely because he didn't want to waste his money going to see it. And it caused a massive outrage and it was like people condemning him for misogyny and sexism and yada yada. And it was like, no, he's basically just telling you he doesn't like the look of the film. And I think this is the problem that people have got, is that Sony are just painting us all as sexist, misogynistic pigs purely because we don't like their product. Yeah, sexist, misogynist pigs and nerds just because we really disagree with what they've done. You know, it's... (sighs) This whole misogyny thing is not remotely true. It doesn't hold. I mean, you look at uh, Star Wars, for example. Uh, Star Wars Episode Seven: the new Jedi hero is a woman. It's a female. We, I didn't see anyone have a problem with that. And if anyone was going to get angry, it's going to be Star Wars fans, right? Like Star Wars nerds are the worst. Exactly. So, you know what? We didn't have a problem with it. And... Uh, what what more can I say? We don't. You shouldn't go around labelling people as sexist just because we don't like your film. So, the film's out in a few weeks' time now. There's probably going to be other little news bits and stuff, but I just wanted to cover the plot to basically show that that is the film that we are getting. Um, in closing on this part, uh, apparently tomorrow is being labelled Ghostbusters Day, and uh, Jimmy Kimmel will be hosting a live gathering of all the original and new Ghostbusters together as they promote the film um, and say how great it is. Because Dan Aykroyd has already come out and said that he has seen a pre-screening of this film and that he thinks it's funnier and scarier than the original two films put together. Well, it's not too difficult with the second one. The second Ghostbusters is kind of average, to be honest, but it can't be as good as the first one. It just can't. I quite enjoy the second one, to be honest. Yeah, the second one's all right, but it's not comparable to the first one, I don't think. Yeah, but I agree with you there, but the second one where they put the slime in the toaster and make it dance, that one scene alone will be better than anything that's in this new film. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm just going to go on record, finally, for all time, we will talk about this, we'll try not to rant about it anymore, but it's going to be crap. It is going to be rubbish. Moving on. Uh, before we cover the movie news, Dave, we should just say there's a couple of quick rest in pieces. Um, first up, today I saw the news that MMA fighter Kimbo Slice has died. Oh, really? I didn't see that. That's, that's very sad. Uh, yeah, um, he was notoriously famous for doing underground sort of street fights originally. Um, he then became a boxer for a while. He did some MMA. I think his record was something like four, no, eight fights with five wins and three defeats or something like that um so you know not the best and also the biggest news of course though is that this week saw the demise of the one the only probably the only person on the planet today obviously he's not on the planet now but on the planet today who could claim to be an actual true icon above any other sports star in the history of existence other than maybe pele it's Mr. Muhammad Ali. Yeah, you just can't out sum up Muhammad Ali, can you? And I don't think, I don't think you can sum up what he meant to untold millions around the world, not just uh, not just as a sportsman, but as a civil rights activist and just as a human being. He's just, it's you know, just terrible to think that we've lost such a legend. I mean, of course, I'm not a big boxing fan. Um, but as you said, he transcended the sport. He was uh, 
civil rights activist for bl the black population of America at a time when they were fighting for their rights. Uh, he was famous, of course, for refusing the draft for the Vietnam War, uh, which cost him a few years of his boxing career. He changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali, became a member of the Black Panthers. Um, you know, just every word that came out of his mouth is just a sound bite that lives on to this day. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Um, but the thing that we will remember him best for, of course, being wrestling geeks that we are, is WrestleMania 1. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that, actually. When he was the special outside ring enforcer for the star-studded main event of WrestleMania 1, which saw Hulk Hogan, Mr. T, and... Do you know what? I cannot think of who the other person was. Uh, Hulk Hogan, Mr. T, Roddy Piper, and... Was it... Wasn't it a, si a six-man tag, or was it just a normal tag? I think it's a normal tag. Oh yeah, so it was Mr. T and Hulk Hogan versus Roddy Piper and Paul Orn Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. Liberace was there. Cindy Lauper was there. Muhammad Ali was the outside um, ring enforcer. Um, Ali, of course, is also famous for fighting Antonio Inoki in 1976 in a boxer versus wrestler match. Oh, I didn't know he did that as well. Uh, yeah, it wasn't very good. It went 15 rounds and Ali threw a total of six punches in the entire fight. Yeah, yeah, that is, was pretty awful. But you know what? I would have to say to anyone, as just a huge film fan as well, I know I'm, I do love a good documentary, and the Muhammad Ali film When We Were Kings is if you can pick it up somewhere as a DVD, pick up When We Were Kings because it's a great summary of Ali's career, and I believe as an extra, it also had. The whole fight of Thriller, Thriller in Manila, where he fought Smoking Joe Fraser, and Rumble in the Jungle, where he fought... Uh, 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 George Foreman. Where, yes, where he fought George Foreman, the grill man. And, uh, yeah, both of those were absolutely stupendous fights. I mean, if you, I'm no boxing fan. I've watched the occasional modern boxing match, but those fights were brutal, especially with Thriller in Manila. And... Just to get an idea of just what kind of man he was, pick up that DVD if you can buy it. It's an amazing documentary. And of course, going full circle there, you mentioned George Foreman and his grill. Uh, the man himself, Hulk Hogan, claims that that deal was once going to be his. The Hulk Hogan grill? Yeah, uh, but he turned it down and they went with George Foreman instead and he lost out on hundreds of millions of dollars. Oh, poor, poor Hulk. Uh, but that's, prob sure that, he, uh... that's probably bollocks, let's be honest. It's got to be, isn't it? Hey, man. Cook of, a, cook of a Hulk Hogan grill. That, that, was the wor that was the worst Hulk Hogan impression I've ever heard. Oh, hey, brother. How do you feel when Hulkamania runs down on you with the Hulkamania grill? No, I, I can't see it. Uh, moving swiftly on, we have brief movie news this week. Uh, we'll get to the superhero movie news in a moment, which is a lot more extensive. Um, Lionsgate CEO John Feltheimer has said that the studio may make as many as seven more Power Ranger movies, this despite the fact that their reboot has yet to be filmed. See, that's just a ridiculous thing to say, isn't it? We might make seven films. Can you imagine? I don't even... Because have you seen the pictures of the new Power Rangers suits? I have not, no. And the picture of... Is it Elizabeth Banks is going to be Rita Rapunzel? <laughs> okay. Rita <laughs> Rapunzel, Repulsa. Rita Repulsa, I think her name is. That kind of makes sense. No, I haven't seen the pictures. Uh, it, it looks terrible, let's be honest. And the fact that they're planning seven more sequels, I have no idea what they're thinking. Um, moving on to horror. Movie studio Bloomhouse have revealed that they have taken up the reins of the next Halloween movie... And most exciting of all, John Carpenter is set to return to the franchise as a producer and possibly the movie's composer too. Oh, that could be interesting, at least. You know, I mean, it's been a long time since we've had a Halloween movie, isn't it? Yeah, and I actually didn't mind Rob Zombie's first Halloween movie, but the second one was terrible. Yeah, I mean, 
they were never going to be fantastic where they uh, kind of reboots of Halloween, but seeing John Carpenter being involved again could be really interesting and seeing what he comes up with musically as well. Now, you mentioned Star Wars earlier on, so I'm interested to get your take on this. Uh, reports have leaked out that reshoots have been ordered for Rogue One, a Star Wars story. If the rumours are true, as much as 40% of the movie needs overhauling for the final cut. Now, apparently Disney are heavily behind a revised screenplay from Christopher McQuarrie. Uh, McQuarrie's rewrite wasn't completed until filming was in full swing, and therefore to bring his vision to the screen, reshoots are required. You know what, I mean, we, we frequently hear news like this. I mean, uh, when Suicide Squad went in for reshoots not so long ago, people were like, oh, you know, it's got to be rubbish. They're having to reshoot it to make it more like Deadpool, or we're going to have to reshoot it to make it less like Batman vs. Superman. It's like, well, you know what, loads of films go in for reshoots just because they miss the occasional scene, they don't get something quite right, they, they realise we need a bridge scene between this and this, and... I don't see it being as being the end of the world. I think Disney know what they're doing with the Star Wars movies. Forty percent is quite a lot, though. Forty percent is a lot, and but do you know what? Maybe the special effects aren't quite right. Um, for me, the trailer looked really good. It looked like it had a great concept, but it being a Star Wars movie, I don't think they need to make it. You know, they don't need to make it a great epic like War and Peace. Fair I enough. think it needs to have that simple story that families can relate to, that children can watch, but that maybe a little edge of darkness for adults can appreciate as well. But yeah, forty percent is a lot. I'd be very surprised if it was that much. So carrying on the sort of Star Wars esque theme, John Boyega has signed on to star as the lead in Pacific Rim Two, which apparently is now back on after being on, then off, then on, then off then on, then off, and now apparently on again. So John Boyega is going to headline Pacific Rim 2. Thoughts? You know what, Pacific Rim 1 was all right, didn't you think? I mean, it had a good look to it, but I'm not so excited that I I'd get all hit up about the second one. I mean, I watch it when it comes out on Blu-ray or DVD to stream or whatever, but I'm not going to go rushing out to a cinema to watch it. Uh, Speaking of the first one, I, my problem with that was that every time I looked at uh, Charlie Hunnam, who of course was the lead in that film, uh, he'd shaved off his beard and that and he looked about 12 years old and I just kept thinking, you're Jax from Sons of Anarchy, where's your beard? Yeah, too, too true. I mean, I don't really watch Sons of Anarchy, but I do. I, I can understand that if you're such a huge fan, you'd be watching and thinking, but you're from Sons of Anarchy. What's going on? And finally, in this week's vanilla movie news, uh, despite being released on the 4th of March, Zootopia continues to take money at the box office. This doesn't surprise me. These kind of films, if they're good, they can just keep on going, can't they? And not only does it continue to take money at the box office, Dave, it has now become only the fourth animated movie in history to pass the $1 billion mark. Okay, um, so how much exactly is it on now, do we know? Uh, I, I just got just over a billion. It's not as much as the 1.3 billion that Civil War's taken, but it is obviously more than the 870-odd million that Batman vs Superman have taken. So let me get this right. The biggest superhero, what should have been the biggest superhero movie of all time, where the two biggest icons of superherodom of all time had a fight, got beaten by a fox in a tie. Yeah. Okay, just so we got that straight. Well done, Warner Brothers. Congratulations. And we will, of course, be touching upon Batfleck vs. Superville again shortly in the superhero news, but that was the brief movie news of the week. Now, before we get to the superhero muse, muse, that's a completely different band. Uh, before we get to the superhero news, Dave, um, it's time to touch upon the crazy, crazy world of professional wrestling as we look at the WWE. Now, 
there's been some recent stories coming out, which we'll get to shortly, but we need to go back a few weeks because of how this show has run for the last few weeks. We didn't get to touch upon the releases that they did recently. Okay, um, I saw some uh, people, a couple of people come back as well, but I wasn't sure who had been uh, let go. Right, so we're talking probably six, eight weeks ago now. They released um, the following. They released Santino Morella, who I didn't even realise was still there. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest, we know he's been on his way out for a long time. I didn't realise he was still there. Uh, he had his moment, let's be honest. Uh, yep, yeah, they also released uh, Hornswoggle. Was he still there, really? He what was, yeah. For the last couple of years. Um, surprisingly to me, they released Dutch Mantel, who on screen was playing uh, Zeb Coulter, um, and I would have thought they'd have kept him on backstage because he's got a lot of booking experience and a lot of knowledge that they could have used. Then again, I guess they've got enough people on booking and they're doing a good job. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, they didn't appear to be using him on screen a lot, though. Most surprisingly, however, out of the people that were cut was, unfortunately, Damien Sandow. Yeah, Damien Sandow. He was a pretty decent wrestler. He, he seemed pretty good at reinventing himself. But the so. thing was with Damien Sandow, he was so good that he could get over any stupid gimmick that they gave him. I don't know if you remember when he was the Miz's stunt double. Yes, I do, yeah. But that, yeah, that was quite funny. Where he literally said nothing and just threw himself out of the ring or threw himself around the wing, ring when the other wrestlers were doing it to the Miz. Shouldn't have worked, should have tanked, but he made it work. And the fans were squarely behind him and they were always calling for him. But the WWE basically said, we have nothing for you. And they released him. He needed a push as a guy, as a wrestler. He needed a push. And I think if they had given him a decent push, the Intercontinental belt... He could have made it work. Uh, Adam Rose, he's been released, but that's not really surprising since he was arrested for domestic violence. Yeah. Um, Wade Barrett asked and got his release. Yeah, he's an all right wrestler. Let's be honest, he's okay. But he has been riddled with injury the last 10 years, hasn't he? I think they kind of... He's been on a downward trajectory after they ruined the whole Nexus thing. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, again, he's had a good couple of gimmicks, hasn't he? And he's had a few little pushes, but he's never going to be a main eventer. And finally, another wrestler asked for and got his release, and this was a huge surprise. It was Cody Rhodes. Yeah, I was surprised by this one, actually. I saw this one. And, again, he's a big talent. He's a great in-ring wrestler. He can work any gimmick you give him and I kind of thought he deserved to be in a higher position than he was in the company so I don't know what's going on there uh, well he has come out and he had a little bit of a tirade against the booking of the WWE because apparently he's been trying to get out of being Stardust for over six months um, but every time he went to creative and gave them ideas on how he could go back to being Cody Rhodes they didn't want to listen in fact they got so ridiculous at one point one writer pretended that they couldn't talk to him because they were working despite the fact the computer in front of them wasn't even turned on oh dear we need to talk we need to talk to vince didn't he i mean i've got sympathy for him because that stardust thing i think it worked for a while but it was never going to get him to the top and i think he's a guy that deserves to be at the top now uh releases and requests for releases aside the Big news before what happened this week. Uh, the big news of the last couple of weeks is the return of the brand split. Now, they've done this before where they had um, Raw and SmackDown as two completely different shows. Uh, what's going to happen with this brand split is that SmackDown is going to move from Thursday nights to Tuesday nights. It's going to be live and they're going to have their own unique look and their own unique roster. What are your thoughts on this, Dave? Because I personally don't think the original brand split necessarily worked because after not very long they basically just started appearing wherever they wanted to yeah you're right and they, they started appearing wherever they wanted to um they had a lot more talent back then they had a lot more 
recognisable headline talent. Now, I think this, they might have to make this work. I would have thought maybe part of the agreement they've got with their new TV channel is that it has to be a distinct roster. So, you know, uh, the stars on this show cannot appear on the other show apart from them, uh, their monthly pay-per-view. So, but my overall thoughts are very simply, I don't think they've got enough talent to do this. Well, if it goes anything like the original brand split, then SmackDown will be the more wrestle wrestling heavy show. If you remember uh, back in the day, SmackDown had the likes of Chris Benoit, Rey Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero. Um, so if they're going to go a similar vein this time, then you would imagine they would have the likes of Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens and AJ Styles on SmackDown. Yeah, but even then, if you met, you know, those people you mentioned, they're great wrestlers, but they're not, they're not big names, they're not big main eventers, you know, I can see them splitting, I can see them splitting, say, Roman Reigns and John Cena up, because they're, they're the two big guys, they want to be the guy, I suppose you say, the big baby face of the company, but everyone else, some like Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, you know, do you do you even list the Undertaker am, am, amongst that? I don't know, but yeah, I agree. They've got a lot of um, younger, up-and-coming stars, which could go on to one show. But I still don't see them. I just don't feel like they've got enough talent at the moment. Speaking of uh, John Cena, as you did there, did you see AJ Styles turn heel on him last week? Yeah, what's all that about? Seriously? Uh, unfortunately, it probably means the burial of AJ Styles' career. It does, doesn't it? I mean, AJ Styles, he's come, he's he's pulled Roman Reigns through one or two decent matches, and here's his reward. He's going to get buried by John Cena. But Dave, did you see what the huge, massive, ginormous wrestling news was this week? Okay, what was that? And I'm not talking about Matt and Jeff Hardy's god-awful promo. You know what? I had I had the luck to turn over, to, to change channels just in time to see that, and I thought, is that Matt Hardy? What's Matt Hardy done to his hair? He's gone all Seth Rollins. He's got, uh, like, a half and half black and white hair, and with this promo, it's all wrong. What are we doing? It's, it's like, it's cleaving shot and then re-edited, because, oh, oh, it was just bad in so many ways, I thought. Hello, Brother Nero. Uh, yeah, I don't get that. But these guys, as far as I'm concerned, neither of them have ever really been very good wrestlers. Both, you know, Jeff Hardy's made his career by jumping off jumping off big ladders and hurting himself. You know, there's a very good reason why, actually, he's not in WWE. And that's because he's... Okay, I'm not going to go into that, but, yeah. And they actually did a throwing the baby angle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that promo was just wrong in so many ways. You know, I remember a part of one of Mick Foley's book going back years and years where he was talking about that uh, there was a match he had with The Rock, which was a last man standing match. And just as, he, just as him and Rock had finished the match, the producer said, hey, stop, man, we need to reshoot this scene. And so they reshot a scene with a camera in a different angle. And when they showed the, showed the match on TV a couple of days later they had this little really short scene in it as well and then Mick Foley said when he was watching a match in the airport a guy said to him hey man that's late that camera wasn't there a second ago you couldn't see it and, and this is exactly how I felt about this promo they kept on edit it kept on changing angle and said well hang on all these angle changes there wasn't a cameraman there a second ago because it was just a big empty building and it's it's just ruined totally ruins any kind of suspension of disbelief of this of this ridiculous promo. The crazy thing is, as well, that it was obviously to promote their match at Slammiversary, so it's supposed to be a serious thing, but TNA have realised how bad it was and have let some of their own wrestlers parody it. Yeah, it's not like these two have never had a match before anyway, is it? I mean, how can it be such a big thing that these two are finally going to have a fight? They've had plenty of matches on their WWE, and none of, most of those haven't really been that good. But, yeah, I'm good. I'm glad they've kind of recognised it's a bad promo. But anyway, the big news this week, Dave, revolves around 
Brock Lesnar. What's he been up to? Brock Lesnar is going to be fighting at UFC 200. Really? Yep. Uh, it was announced by the UFC that Brock Lesnar will be fighting at UFC 200. Uh, the WWE then came out and said, that's true. He's still under contract to us. Um, and he will be fighting at SummerSlam as well. But yes, he will be appearing at UFC 200. You know what? That is actually really cool. And I think this is... Um, I don't know who he's going to be fighting. Uh, uh, he's going to be fighting a guy called Mike... Uh, no, Mark Hunt, I think his name is. And he's the eighth ranked heavyweight in the UFC. Hey, Ooh, okay then. It could go, could go either way then. I mean... so that's the thing. The problem with this is... Whilst on paper it looks awesome and it's a win-win for everybody, it could go horribly wrong for the WWE because Brock Lesnar could get his ass handed to him. Well, you know, anyone who's a fan of Brock Lesnar knows he didn't have a perfect record in UFC. But, you know, he had a good couple of matches where he just dominated people. But, yeah, that's UFC. He also had one or two matches where he made silly mistakes and he got tapped out or he... Uh, he, you know, he generally got beaten, but he's one of a few guys. He, actually, he's the only guy so far, isn't he, to make a successful transition and make it make it work for himself. So, you know, good luck to him. I hope this works. So that was a quick delve into the world of professional wrestling. So I think it might be time to do some superhero news. Right, movie, superhero movie news. First up, we have got Ron Perlman, who apparently has been quoted as saying that he would like to return to the comic book genre to play none other than Cable in Deadpool 2. Now, I know we mentioned this off-air a few weeks ago, Dave. I think this would be awesome. I disagree. I totally and utterly disagree. Yeah, but you want Liam Neeson. Yeah, I do. I want Liam Neeson. He looks like Cable. He's a kick-ass guy. He can, he can pull it off. Ron Perlman couldn't look any more like Cable if he tried. No, he looks... Oh, he's, he'd just be too comedic. I don't think he'd bring the, the correct gravitas and mood to Cable. You know, I think Cable is basically a complete straight guy. If they can have... Because we know Cable's going to be in Deadpool first, right? Deadpool 2, before he's in, before he's in any other X-Men film. Correct. So, uh, so, I just want him to be a completely straight character in that kind of little Deadpool microverse. I want him to be totally straight, whereas Deadpool is still the comedic one. You no, know? but I just don't feel like Ron Perlman can make it work for me. All right. Well, we'll agree to disagree on that one, but I think we'll agree on this particular point. Uh, Jesse Eisenberg has confirmed that he will return as Lex Luthor in the Justice League movie, which is being called the Justice League. Um, for me, that is one massive strike against that film. Well, do you know what? I feel like he does. I actually feel like he does need to come back. I feel like it does need to have him in it to maintain some kind of continuity. But it's not like I'm hugely bothered about it. Um, it's not like I'm going to be celebrating his return in any way. I mean, I do really like Jesse Eisenberg. I think he's a fantastic actor, but I don't feel like he had anything to work with in that film. And Bra that's it. Brian Singer apparently has a desire to bring back the original cast into the X-Men fold. As the next movie is set to take place in the 1990s, this would probably make sense as it would be 20 years after the events of First Class. That's true, but that would kind of be a bit weird now because you've got all new actors. Yeah, but if you think about it, this is a point someone made to me about X-Men Apocalypse in that despite the fact that it had been a long time since we'd first seen them, none of them have aged. Like in the ten years between Days of Future Past and Apocalypse, none of them looked any different. Yeah, but some of them looked a bit more mature, but it would be a bit more weird that 
it was supposed to be you just had them a movie of them in, in the 80s right where they're all about that age if you now go to a movie where you have Halle Berry and Famke Janssen again as the X-Men they look they look a lot older now so how could you have those guys in a movie about them in the same people in the 90s Speaking of X-Men Apocalypse, it dropped off significantly in its second weekend and has to date taken 401,448,823 at the global box office, which, as ridiculous as it sounds, isn't that successful. It's not that, su- that successful for such a big film, is it? I mean, it's, I think, I would have thought from such a, a big movie they would have been thinking around about 700 million to a billion what do you think well you would have thought that they would imagine it would take somewhere in the region of Deadpool which was just under 800 million yeah I think it just goes to show as well that uh, what a success Deadpool was because Deadpool uh, I'm not sure what the budget of X-Men Apocalypse was but I'm sure it was a lot bigger than Deadpool right well yeah since Deadpool only cost 50 million to make yeah, I think it probably goes to show. I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised if the next X-Men movie was a much smaller budget. And finally, in this week's superhero news, despite being... Uh, before we get to this, have you seen the end of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? I haven't. I'm an episode behind, so I haven't seen the last episode yet. Alright, okay, well, despite being down in the ratings, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has been renewed for a fourth season. Um, you know, this season has been a bit kind of up and down for me. I... I'm not sure how I feel about it anymore. This season has been crap, Dave. And you know what, right? And this isn't spoiling anything for you, but you remember when we spoke about this show a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and I said that basically Grant Ward slash Hive was Neo from The Matrix. Yes, he was. Right. And again, this isn't spoiling anything for you, but in the last episode, it goes full Matrix. It's like the person who's directing this episode likes the matrix and has just decided do you know what screw it i'm gonna put in this massive section that looks just like the matrix <laughs> okay that's kind of weird right and i just sat there and i just went this is just like the matrix except really really bad and they they leave it on this massive cliffhanger at the end and i'm just like i don't really need a cliffhanger if you could have just ended this show now and i wouldn't care yeah i mean that's a bit of it. i kind of almost feel like they need to make it a little bit more intertwined with the movies but I don't know I mean I don't know where this TV series needs to go now I mean I actually quite liked the last season because there was a little bit of a cliffhanger but the major story they had was finished but I don't know I I guess I'll let you know when I've finished watching the next episode but um, I need to be able to sit down and watch it with the kids yeah we'll touch upon that next week and so that was this week's superhero news We will be getting to Dave's Week of Geek shortly, but first, it's time, and we haven't done one of these in a while, for a top ten. There's something ripping curious about this broadcast. So what top ten have you got for us this week, Dave? In Kind of in honour of X-Men Apocalypse, I really enjoyed X-Men Apocalypse, but this top ten is the top ten X-Men that still need to be in an X-Men movie to do them justice, okay? So one or two of these might have been an X-Men film already, but they haven't been done justice, right? Very simple. Fair enough. Off you go. Okay, this is in no particular order, by the way. No particular order of of favourite, but I think you'll get that one or two of these are my favourite. Okay, at the top we've got X-23. Now, she is a clone clone slash assassin um, also known as Laura Kinney. She's, her story is basically she was a clone of Wolverine. This company, mysterious, big mysterious company, uh, found, managed to get hold of some of Wolverine's DNA and they were going to clone him. But do you know what? They didn't have enough genetic information to make a male clone, so they make a female clone. And they also give her the uh, adamantium claws and she's actually really really quite cool character she's been for a lot in her very short time and she's actually really kick-ass character she's got her own comic at the moment 
called All New All Doom, called her All New Wolverine. And I would just really love to see her in an X-Men film. Who knows, maybe she could take the reins from Wolverine, as we all know Hugh Jackman's going to retire after the next Wolverine movie, right? And that kind of looked like that might be where they go in with the post credit scene anyway? It did, I can only hope. And if they find the right actress to play uh, Laura Kinney, that'd be awesome. Um, also, she did maybe in a little comment called NYX number three. And just as a tip to anyone, if you can pick that up cheap on eBay, do so. Because if a character appears in the own movie, the comic skyrockets in price. You try buying a copy of Deadpool's first appearance now, you just can't do it. In at number nine? In at number nine is Gateway. Now, the unique thing about Gateway is he was an aborigine. He was an aborigine. He was a really quite mysterious mutant. He can, he can create wormholes. He can travel through time. He's kind of a little precog- precognitive as well. Uh, one of the cool things about him was he'd just show up every so often in the X-Men's garden and they'd go, oh, Gateway, what's up? And then he'd spin this little thing around his head, I forgot the name of it, a bolas or something like that, and he'd teleport them somewhere. And they'd be like, great, what are we doing here now? And be some kind of world, some kind of place where they need to do something. He was a really quite cool, mysterious character. Anyway, uh, in at number eight is Dazzler. Now, did you spot a little appearance by Dazzler in X-Men Apocalypse? And was it actually in the film, or did it get cut? I think it might have been cut, but I believe there was a little scene where Cyclops holds up a CD, and it's a, in, a, in a shop, and it's a Dazzler CD. I, I just thought that was quite cool. Because it was so, going it was originally there was a rumor that Taylor Swift was going to play the role. Uh, I don't know how I would have felt about that. I don't think. Yeah, I love Taylor Swift. I think she's actually quite. <laughs> what? Yeah, she's got. She's got. She's. She does catchy songs, what can I say? Oh dear, uh, oh dear. I, you can't be my friend no, anymore. Not, not, being, not being true to my Nine Inch Nails heart, but there you go. Uh, anyway, Dazzler, she's a mutant pop star. Originally in the 70s, she was a disco star, but since then she's kind of involved. She's got the unique ability to turn sound into light, which was obviously why she was so cool as a disco star. But her first appearance was way back in X-Men number 130, which would have been in the 70s. And she's she's just evolved so much in the comics recently. She's she worked with Shield for a while. There was a suggestion that she was going to become president in the future. And more recently, she's joined A Force with like She Hulk and Captain Marvel and some other female superheroes. I just love to see her in a movie, and maybe even as a more punkish version of herself. And next on the list is Domino. Uh, she's. She could be a really good as one of Cable's best buddies because she is in the comics one of Cable's best friends. Her, her quite unbelievable ability is that she manipulates probability. She makes her own luck, and she kind of got this weird facial feature that she looks kind of like a panda, which is kind of a weird. I'm not sure how he'd make that work in movie. But her first appearance was in X Force Eight alongside Cable, and I'm kind of hoping the X Men are going to go in the direction that they make an X. Force movie next. Scrap X Men. Let's make an X Force movie. Let's go that way. And she'd be a, a welcome addition. So in at number six. In at number six is Chamber, also known as Jonathan Starsmore. He was shoots. He's got this weird ability. He's from the from the nose down. His chest is kind of on fire. Okay. He kind of looks a bit like Ghost Rider that way, but it's because he shoots psychic energy from his chest. And he can only talk in a psychic voice. He'd be this. Usually, he tapes up his chest with uh, leather and with belts and stuff like that. So it kind of looks really cool. I think it'd be a really cool addition. He's supposed to be English. He's supposed to have a really kind of deep Cockney accent. I just think he'd look really cool in a movie if you can have a new generation of heroes. Put it that way. His first appearance was in Gen X number one, I believe, way back in the early late nineties. Um, number next five. List, which I believe is number five. Have you ever heard of Brew? Uh, only Iron Brew. Iron, Iron Brew, yeah, I haven't had that for a while. So, no, I um, haven't, no. Yeah, Brew is a little mutant alien uh, with high intelligence. Basically, nothing else to say about this guy. He's a tiny little alien in a suit. Imagine the alien from the Aliens movies, but two and a half foot tall in a suit. Does he actually look like those aliens? 
it does look a bit like those aliens, yeah. With the kind of uh, the long head and all sorts of um, He's been in the X Men comics more recently. He's 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 quite fun. What can I say? He's he's not a huge character, but I'd love to see a tiny little alien alien in a suit just to kind of pump the weirdness up there. And it can maybe mean the X Men go to, go into space. That's where so many of the X Men stories are. They're in space. Uh, but I don't think audiences will buy it. So who knows? In at number three. Then number three is Rogue. Now, don't get me wrong, I quite, I liked Rogue in the first three X-Men movies, X-Men 1, 2, 3, X-Men 3, The Last Stand. She's okay, she's an alright character, but is she Rogue from the comics? Hell no, she is not. So, I would like to see a true Rogue that we have in the comics, all full of, all full of sun and sass, super powers, you know, she can fly, She's almost invulnerable, she's got super strength, and she's just a really strong character. Just yeah. The way they had her in the movies, she was just weak and lame. Okay, I like the fact that she had she was a bit scared of her powers, the way rogue is in the comics. But you know what? We need a proper rogue, and that's what I want to see. Let's have her be a bit older, maybe twenty-five to thirty, something like that. A really strong actress. That's why I want to see my rogue. Is it number two? Next on the list, what is this? Number two? Yep. Is Bastion. Now, Stu, have you ever heard of Bastion? I have heard of Bastion, but I couldn't tell you much about him. Now, Bastion has quite a long, complicated history, but to cut it incredibly short, he was a super sentinel from the future who came back to. Uh, uh, Hunt, who came back, I believe, to kill one of the X. I may be mixing up my stories, but to kill one of the X Men to stop them to wipe out mutants or something like that. But the X Men almost stopped him before he downloaded himself into a government supercomputer. From there, the X Men managed to destroy him by sending him through a portal called the Siege Perilous. Now, the Siege Perilous kind of this giant magic portal that judges you in, that judges you and then dumps you out somewhere in time and space. Now it dumped, now it judged Bastion and dumped him. He became a kind of weird, um, almost human robot. But he was also still obsessed with hunting down and killing mutants. Now, that's what a good story I think would be quite cool. He was a really super powered villain, really overpowered villain. He was able to take down the X-Men almost several times and to have I know it's a bit terminate, Terminator-ish but to have this super sense now from the future in a more frightening human shape would be rather cool I think. and finally top of the list number one finally top of the list number one now do you know what I never thought I'd say this but Cyclops see now before you go any further I actually thought that Cyclops was better in X-Men Apocalypse than he's ever been he was better in X-Men Apocalypse than he's ever been, but he's still not Cyclops. He's still not my Cyclops of the comics. You know, Cyclops, he's gone... Cyclops is such an old, storied character now. He's got... He's become so well-developed. And I want to see a Cyclops in complete mastery of his skills. I want to see a Cyclops that is a leader. A Cyclops that is... You know, he's willing to turn to Professor X and go and say, No, you're not in charge anymore. You've had your turn. It's my turn, and that's the Cyclops I want to see. I want to see the established leader who can lead, who can use his powers, and he's not afraid. He's not afraid to make hard decisions. Thank that's you. why, despite being quite a boring character sometimes, Cyclops is my number one choice. Isn't he a bit of a mentalist now? More recently in the comics, people keep on making reference to, oh, you don't want to go crazy like Cyclops did. You don't want, uh, you know we're all on the bad side of humanity after what Cyclops did. So we know Cyclops did something to try and maybe take down the Inhumans, but we haven't seen what he did. We haven't seen what happened. So is he gone? Is he not? We don't know. I'm sure he'll be back at some point. And that was this week's top 10. So we are coming towards the end of another episode of World of Stew, episode 54, in case you missed the very beginning, which means it must be time 
こうです。Yes, indeed, we are here with Dave's Week of Geek. So, Dave, what have you been doing in the last two weeks of your geek? I watched a great movie this weekend. I wasn't expecting to have watched it, but、uh, having mentioned documentaries earlier on, I watched The Resurrection of Jake the Snake Roberts. I've actually watched that myself, and it is awesome. It is awesome, and do you know what? I, any, any fan of old school wrestling, I defy anyone to be genuinely moved by this movie to see. To see that character and that person who was such a legend on, on wrestling when we were kids. And I don't think I realised when I was a kid just how much of a talent he was, but to watch, it, to watch his matches back again, to watch his promos back again, he was just a genius, wasn't he? He was indeed, yeah. Yeah, but anyway,、um, if, no, if someone else hasn't heard of it, this tells the story of Jake Snake Roberts. He was. A legend of wrestling in the 80s and almost a little bit of the early 90s. But towards the mid 90s, he kind of fell into a downward spiral of drugs and alcoholism to the point,、um, to the point he reached not so many years ago where he's retired, he can't work, he's not into, he hasn't got a family, he hasn't really got any friends. But a very,、uh, really, probably one of his best friends, probably one. Uh, Diamond Dallas Page, another wrestler, took him under his wing,、uh, rejuvenated him, tried to get him off,、uh, has tried to get him off drink and,、uh, drink and drugs, and this tells that story to Jake the Snake Roberts getting clean and getting back on.、Uh, he doesn't really get back into the company, does he? But he can,、um, it's just a great story. And it, you know what? It made one big question for me why, if Diamond Dallas Page is so respected, Why did he get buried by The Undertaker as soon as he joined the WWE? Because he wasn't doing DDP yoga back then. Yeah.、So、obviously, he just went into the company as a WCW guy.、Um, they decided to bury him. He left the company. He created DDP yoga, which now is one of the premier、um, sports related treatments that people can do.、Um, he helps loads of people around the world. And funny you should mention this because I actually tweeted. DDP,、uh, just to say you're a miracle worker, having just watched the resurrection of Jake Snake Roberts, and he retweeted me. Oh, really?、Yeah. Fantastic. So,、uh, there you go.、Uh, DDP is actually a miracle worker. Yeah, absolutely, he is a legend. And you know what? I always, even when he's in WCW, I haven't watched his matches. I thought he was always, he, he was always a bit of a talent, probably、uh, the most underrated talent they had on. That show, particularly in the later years. Can I just say, a film I watched, which we won't discuss now because you won't have seen it yet, but I just need to mention it and we will do a review of it. Hardcore Henry is bloody mental. Do you know what? I saw the trailers for that and I desperately wanted to go see it, but、uh, it just wasn't on at the cinema the times I was able to go see it. So I am really keen for that to come out on Blu ray and watch it because it, it does look absolutely psychotic. It, uh, it's not really normally my sort of film, but we'll touch upon that more once you've seen it. Only a week of geek. But anyway, on, on to comics.、Uh, it's probably just over a week ago since I watched it. I read it now. But obviously, this is DC's biggest moment of the year. This was the moment where they kind of relaunched the DC Comics universe. This was DC Universe Rebirth number one. Now, this tells a story.、Uh, you kind of went into it briefly a couple of weeks ago, didn't you, Stu? But, But yes. This, tell,、yeah. this tells the story of、um, Wally West. He realizes that something is missing from the DC universe. Some, something's gone wrong with the universe. And over, I think it was about 80 pages or so, he's trying to get into touch with people, he's lost in time and space. He's trying to get into touch with people in the 
uh, within the universe to try and make them realize something's wrong and he's trying to find some kind of anchor to let him get a foothold in reality basically he tries batman it doesn't work with batman he tries i wasn't sure who it was he tries some old guy in an old people's home it doesn't work he tries the love of his life it doesn't work all these people he keeps he keeps he keeps on trying until he tries uh, the original flash i'm struggling to remember barry allen he tries barry allen and barry allen is like who are you dude and if you're a big fan of the dc universe this moment will you know this moment will have you in tears because how can barry allen not know who wally west is it's like how can you it's like saying david cameron not knowing who boris johnson is or maybe uh <laughs> seriously did you just compare barry allen and wally west to david cameron okay, all and... right it's like matt it's like jeff hardy not knowing who matt hardy is it's like uh, it's like clark kent not being able to even recognize lois lane but of course it all goes back doesn't it to before the new 52 where yeah. the flashpoint incident where wally west went back and saved his mum and it changed history, and that was where the new 52 universe came from. That's right, and you know, this is, you know, this is a complicated story, isn't it? Because right away, I'm not a big DC fan, okay? I haven't read Flashpoint, I haven't read Infinite Crisis, I haven't read Infinite Crisis, and you know, all these big DC stories of the last 10, 15 years, I haven't read them. I've dropped in and out, I know a little bit about it, I've read, I've been reading the new 52 Batman, but I don't know the DC Universe really. So, most of this comic was totally lost on me, I have to say. Apart from the references at the start to a watchmaker and the big reveal at the end, I was just like, what? What's going on? So, I, I understand that this is a very technical, complicated story that fans of the DC universe, the whole DC universe for the last 30 years will be laughing this up. But I, I bought this thinking, this is going to be a good jump on point if I start reading more, reading more DC comics. And right on the first page, there's a, there's a little asterisk that says, oh, before you read this, read Justice League number 50 and... And Batman, and Batman, number 50, whatever it is. I'm like, what? No, I don't want to read those. And it's got some weird stuff. It's like, okay, the Bat, the Superman of the new 52 universe is dead. But actually, it doesn't matter because the original Superman from the pre-new 52 universe is alive and well with Lois Lane and his daughter. So, like, what? What's going on? But that, that to me is a bit confusing because everybody else, such as Batman is still part of the New 52 continuity, aren't they? Yeah. But Superman is now not part of the New 52 continuity, he's pre-New 52 continuity. Exactly. So, I, you know, that is a bit confusing, and I think this is just a way of DC, you know, a lot of long-time fans of DC Comics have basically been saying, we don't like the changes you've made, you've rebooted it, you've got rid of a lot of the history of the characters, and this is just a way of kind of wrangling it so that actually now you've got all the history. And especially with Superman, it's clearly them saying, do you know what? We messed up. This new 52 Superman isn't what people want. So here you go. Here's the original Superman who's been alive and well all this time, just hiding and living an ordinary life. And of course, the big reveal is that Wally, with, Wally West tells them that 10 years of their history has been erased by, it turns out to be Dr. Manhattan from The Watchmen. Yeah, that is the big... It, they don't directly say it's Dr. Manhattan, do they? But there's, uh, there's this character, Pandora, who get, gets vaporised in a little bit of blue... Uh, in a blue dust explosion towards the middle. And it's the, ba the big... And towards the end, Batman finds, for some mysterious reason... Uh, the comedian's badge in the back of his back cave. But now, the, the confusing thing to me here, Dave, is that obviously the Watchmen live in a completely different universe, which has never touched upon the regular DC universe ever, right? That's right. No, not once. In fact, if you watch the Watchmen film and in the original Watchmen graphic novel, it 
refers to the DC Universe as being a comic book. So, are, is the implication here now that all of the original DC Universe, or Batman, Superman, Flash, Wonder Woman, all just exist because Dr. Manhattan created them based off of a comic book he saw in his own real world? That, that could be a suggestion, can it? It'll be... Uh... Or is Dr. Manhattan's universe completely separate on its own and he's kind of... It's, it is a confusing concept. Um, you know, I, have, I am interested to see where they're going to go with this. Are they going to go into the idea that maybe uh, Dr. Manhattan and Comedian all existed in the DC universe, but Dr. Manhattan changed history? Because obviously at the end of Watchmen, Dr. Manhattan goes off, doesn't he? He says he's going to go and create universes. He does, doesn't he? So he, and he's clearly all super powerful. But did you see my comment on our on our Facebook page? I did, yes. But refer to it now. My wife Tamsin was out the other night. I decided to watch uh, the Watchmen, and as I was watching Watchmen, I realised, oh yeah, okay, yeah, there's a badge. You know, I just read DC Universe number one, and there's uh, there's the guy. There's the guy playing Jeffrey Dean Morgan. There's him playing the comedian. Great, I think he did a great job. But then I thought, tick tock, tick tock. Hang on. Jeffrey Dean Morgan also played Thomas Wayne, Batman's dad, right at the start of Batman vs Superman. What if, what if Zack Snyder is actually a total genius here? And he's coincide. He's got together with Jeff Johns, who wrote DC Universe number one, and said. Hey, what if the comedian is really Batman's dad? What if we make people realise, hey, the DC Universe movies actually started ten years ago with Watchmen, and now we're doing it in the comics as well. What if this is the greatest conspiracy ever, and they've actually all tricked us into having what could be the greatest movie story and the greatest comic book story of all time? I'll tell you one person who's not happy. Who's that? Alan Moore. No, he, he's got to be furious because he never wanted Watchmen to be part of the DC Universe, did he? Uh, no, and the, apparently in 2010, uh, DC tried to give him the rights to the Watchmen back, um, but with certain caveats attached, and he refused. So he always never wanted there to be any prequels or sequels or anything, so he is going to hate this. Uh, I am in no doubt that he's going to be hating this. I mean... I'm interested to see where this story leads. You know, could it see, could it lead to the comedian fighting Batman? Could it lead to? Uh, it's clearly going to lead to quite a big story because this is just the kicking off point of this story. And you know, what? I didn't like this comic as I thought it did a good job. It is clearly rebooting the universe for long-time fans, but as a jumping-on point, it couldn't be worse. It was terrible. Uh, you know, it makes me feel like I've got no interest in the DC Universe moving forward, apart from just to keep an eye on it and see what's going on with the Watchmen. Um, but on a good point, do you know what? It was cheap. It was two quid for an 80-page comic. And these days, that value is really something that's missing in a lot of the big, in the, the big companies' comics. So, you know what? Pick it up. If you like it, it doesn't matter. But you might have to pay a bit more because after deciding I didn't like mine, I put it straight on eBay because it's, people are going nuts. DC fans are going nuts for it. I sold mine for 10 quid two days <laughs> after I bought it, which was ten, five times more than I bought it for. So, you know, two quid, bargain, you can't go wrong. So what else have you been doing in your week of geek? Oh, I was also going to mention, wasn't I? As Steve Rogers, Captain America number one. Uh, if you haven't been keeping up with the comics... Uh, Steve Rogers, he was an old man, his super soldier serum ran out, so he gave the title of Captain America to the Falcon. So the Falcon has been Captain America for a while, but Steve Rogers, he got beaten up, he, he met a, a superpowered little girl, he was able to turn him back into a um, young man again, and so he's relaunched with a brand new series. Now, the first issue wasn't anything to write home about, most of it, right up until the very last two pages. The Red Skull is back as well. Baron Zemo has kidnapped someone. 
and Captain America has gone has gone on a rescue mission to rescue this captured scientist. Captain America is in trouble as well. One of Captain America's sidekicks, some random guy from the 90s you never heard of, jumps on board to help Cap. Cap punches out Baron Zemo. And what should happen? But I'll be damned if Captain America grabs his son sidekick, chucks him out of the back of chucks him out the back of the shield um, shield Quinjet. This guy is plummeting to his death, right? I have no doubt about this. <laughs> and which this fact seems to have been kind of like glazed over by the world's media and by comic fans around the world. Captain America has just killed a sidekick. Killed a sidekick. And then the very last page, Captain America, rim look on his face, says, Hail Hydra. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No, I don't know about you, Stu, but this was, you know, in the same week as DC Universe number one came out, this is, you know, I don't know if Marvel did this on purpose, but this took a lot of headlines, this took a lot of comic fans, and made them kind of go, what? You can't do that! You know, seriously, the writers of, of Captain America have had death threats. <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, okay, get real people, it's a comic, and, you know, it's okay to dislike it if you want to, but at the end of the day, it's a story, and they might work its way into a story, but it makes sense. But for me, this was a kind of like, oh my god, what is going on? Uh, I don't know, how, did you see this, too? Uh, I, I have been following the story, but I haven't actually read the comic book myself, no. Yeah, well, if I'm being honest, I only bought the comic because uh, it was a Scotty Young variant with the kind of babyish, uh, baby-styled art on the cover. And I didn't expect to like it, but I kind of liked it. It was more a comic. I might buy number two, because I've never liked the Captain America comics per se. I like him as a member of the Avengers, but this revelation of the last, of the last page really did make me think, okay, this could be a cool story if you're going to go with an evil Captain America. I mean, there's a lot of different fan theories of why this is taking place. Um... Just, you know, my simple fan, fan theory is, do you know what, um, Red Skull at the moment is supposed to have the powers of Professor Xavier, uh, the psychic and telepathic powers, so maybe he's influencing Captain America's mind in some way, or maybe, maybe something went wrong when Captain America was uh, kind of magically made young again. So well, I didn't, one of the, didn't one of the um, creative bods at Marvel confirmed that it wasn't any sort of mind control. Oh, did they? I didn't see that. But, you know, the thing is, they might deny it, but it might be, it might be true anyway. But, yeah, this, um, either way, this, again, could be a really interesting story going forward. And uh, Civil War 2, having started with Marvel in the net, uh, last week, um, I would have reviewed that this week, but my number one issue still hasn't turned up in the post. Um, you know, this could be a really in interesting part of the story as well, if there's a truly evil Captain America. So do you know what happens, who dies in Civil War? I don't yet, so don't tell me. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what about the, going back to DC Comics, the revel revelation in Batman about his villain? Uh, again, my Batman Rebirth number one is on the way. But yeah, the, um... The revelation about the Joker being three people, is that what you're talking about? I am, yeah. Which kind of doesn't really make sense, because he's supposed to be the world's greatest detective. Yeah, that doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, surely that should be why it doesn't make sense to Batman, is because Batman will be looking going, this doesn't make sense, how could I have not have seen this? I'm the world's greatest detective. Especially um, when you look at the image from the comic, and the three pictures of the Joker all look completely different. It's clearly three different people, isn't it? They show three different pictures of the Joker uh, from different ages of comics. Like, you know, that would make just a sense, much sense of a Joker saying there's three different Batmen, and he'd be right <laughs> because you've got the Batman of the New Fifty Two universe, and you've got the Batman of the pre New Fifty Two, which, as you've said, is confusing because the Batman of the New Fifty Two universe is a good ten years younger, right? Yes. <laughs> so, what, what's going on? Uh, anything else in your week of geek? Um, I think that was just about it this week. I think you know I've read I've read some great comics. I think if um, 
if you want to pick up a really great Wolverine comic, please pick up Old Man Logan. I haven't enjoyed a Wolverine comic for a long time, okay? And Old Man Logan is just so good. This week, uh, in last week's issue, he was fighting against the Reavers, which kind of robot, uh, robot mutant type cyborgs. And there was just a great scene with Wolverine taking on a guy with a minigun and a rocket launcher. And it's brutal, it's violent. Uh, Wolverine is cantankerous and moody and a total loner. It's what Wolverine hasn't been for a good 20 years or so. So I implore people to pick it up, give it a go. You know, if you can't, if you can't find the individual issues, pick up the trade paperback and just give it a go. So that is the end of episode 54 of World of Stew. Um, the closing song that we're going to finish with this week is going to be a song called Shout of the Devil, which was used by Brock Lesnar for some of his fights in UFC. I can't remember what this sounded like, but um, he's got pretty good taste in music, that guy. Um, before we go, it just leaves me enough time to say, if you like this show, you can find it on the Pancast Network or Pancast Productions Network, which you can find at pancast.co.uk. Um, they have a network set up for lots of different podcasts of different comedy and music and geek-related stuff such as ours. So just go and check out their website, and you might find a podcast there that grabs you by the balls and keeps you occupied for an hour or 90 minutes, however long it needs to be. You can also follow us on our own website, which is silentmovieman.com wix.com forward slash world of stew where you'll find lots of blog posts all the latest episodes of this show as well as links to buy all of my books um and so it just leaves me enough time to say thank you for being on the show again dave always fun always welcome Stu. uh thank you for everyone who's been listening and until next week i keep it geek <laughs>